And so we have to ask ourselves the question, why is there increasingly a securitization of the state, a militarization of the state, the militarization of, of the police force? And, and what we do see is a rise of what I call a rent-seeking elite that act as gatekeepers, that extract and extort bribes and commissions from people who are trying to do business with the state. And we don't want to talk about this. We pretend it does not exist. But in the corridors, you will listen to people trying to do business and you will discover the, the, the truth about it. Many of them business people, small black businesses who say they are unable to even build businesses because a vast part of their profits have to go after paying some corrupt official. And here we are destroying the very industrial capacity we should be building to make our country successful and to create the jobs. And so yes, if one goes back in time to uh, the, the Kudesa talks, it was very interesting. You know, history in hindsight, we can all be a lot cleverer than we were then. The VAT strike was a very important strike that was spearheaded by Kasatu with a broad coalition that included black business to black sash to civil society groups. And we took a stand in 1992 against the unilateral restructuring at an economic level of the state. And we said, while you are having political negotiations in Kadesa, we have to construct a negotiation process around economic transformation. And at the research that Kusatu had done in the late 80s, we knew that we are inheriting structural problems to economic transformation. We knew this, and we knew that all of us had to make some compromises. So in that context, what we proposed in the aftermath of the strike that saw Baron de Plessis leave his position and Derek Keyes come in, we had an agreement with Derek Keyes to, to set up a national economic forum within which we will discuss the tough choices we had to make about how this economy could grow in a way that will deliver a dividend in terms of the challenges of poverty and inequality that had dominated apartheid. We had an agreement to do that. It was veto. And what we had was a substitution of black economic empowerment, which did not address the fundamental challenges of unemployment. So today it is very interesting to see many people in the corporate sector and around and the analysts around the world say, well, we need an economic codesa. Many of these people are people that vetoed it in the first instance, when the opportunity to do that came up in 1992. You know, that process of marginalization then got compounded in 1996 when the RDP was closed up. RDP with all its weaknesses. And one of its main weaknesses being that we misunderstood the institutional capacity of the state to deliver. But what do we do in that one single move that no one, not even within the ANC or the cabinet or the constitutional structures was involved in, we introduced a policy that struck at the heart of the social consensus we had. We destroyed the social consensus in this country. And then we had the rule by the leader, who knew what we wanted. A consequence of that type of leadership is the type of denialism we ended up with the HIV AIDS debacle. 350,000 people that died needlessly in our country. That's the denialism we had. But that's what characterized leadership. So if you take education as, a, as an example, why does it take a court to instruct a minister to deliver textbooks. Why do we have that and still claim to be a democracy? Then we have a situation of extraordinary situation of some of the political glitterati attacking the decision to go to court as an attack on majoritarianism. What a load of 
absolute trash that is. When we are electing you to a position, whether you're a corporal, whether you're the dean of the, of the university, we are not giving you some divine right to rule us. That isn't feudalism. Feudalism is dead. Buried as we buried apartheid. So this is where we've got to come back to ourselves. What do we do to ensure that our children are educated? What is our role as parents, as the media, as people that are very good within the public service that are committed to things, within the trade union movement? What is the role of trade union leaders? There is an epidemic of sexual assault against the girl child in our schools today. It's happening in, by people we've put our children in trust with. The latest flavor of the month is Barakana. The massacre at Marikana, because that's what it was. And if you had to analyze it, what caused it to happen? It didn't happen overnight. It's something that has been festering for the last 10 years. And in the context where leadership, I'm not talking about government leadership, I'm talking about union leadership. I'm talking about the leadership at a local government level, and leadership within the, the management that runs those mines. What happened that we all failed to read the signs when they were as clear as daylight for us to see? Because these are workers that were union members. They don't get up one day and say, we're going to march with traditional weapons, and we are going to attack people. And I think what is an outrage is to have the sort of perception that these are illiterate workers who are Muslim. If I go back to my own history, we didn't build the union movement in the public sector. We went to those very hostels which built the backbone of the union movement that became Kosato. And those are those workers, illiterate, living in hovels, largely brutalized, who taught me the most important lessons I know in my life. And I'm not in any sense saying that violence can be justified. It's unacceptable. Whether it's strike violence, whether it's rape, whether it's sexual assault of our children in, in, the, uh, in our schools, it's all wrong. Should not happen in a democracy. But what happens when leaders don't listen, when the management doesn't listen, when the political leadership doesn't listen, then violence becomes a language. And this collective bargaining issue, which is an economic issue, it is a political issue. Because, you know, I can, frankly, I don't understand the debate about nationalization, uh, which predatory elite are we going to create a new feeding trough for? Because that's what it seems to me. Because we have nationalized mineral rights. And I'm, I know, as a trade unionist, that mining in South Africa is deep level mining, requiring the type of engineering capacity and management that is the most complex needed in the world. And we are struggling to run our schools and hospitals, and we want to run deep level mining. <laughs> so what's the logic of it? So if I look at those, the, the licenses that have been granted to these mines, it incorporated a social plan which obliged people to invest in the environment. I would say that the platinum belt, in fact, gave us a unique opportunity, because it's a post-apartheid development. The platinum belt gave us a chance to redesign the non-racial cities of South Africa. We're starting from scratch. We just repeated the part in spatial plan of the past. I think this is about being honest with ourselves. It's not about attacking anyone. It's about being honest and speaking truth to power. And whether that's corporate power, union power, whether that's the power of, of political power, we need to be stand up and make ourselves heard. And we don't have to claim to have a blueprint. In the world today, there is no blueprint. I work in countries in much worse conditions that they face than what we are facing here in South Africa. We have a wonderful platform in which to build to go forward. And as part of the Mohi Bright Foundation on the index that we issue, which is a very comprehensive index on governance, we are number five.
but they are warning signs that if we do not deal with the issue of human rights, of the rule of law, of, of economic inclusion, well, the DNA of this democracy will drift towards those countries that are failing. So it's our individual duty as citizens to stand up today and say, it's not about someone else doing it. What am I prepared to do to make this democracy work for all our citizens? And I think that's what your father would have wanted to see. So thank you very much.